quarter of a century. I was doing all right, okay? I was doing all right until we were riding in the car yesterday, trying to do something nice for Kristen, go celebrate her birthday. And her and her friend just start laughing hysterically in the back. And I was like, what are y'all laughing at? And they just wouldn't tell me. So later, I think Kristen got to feeling guilty. And so she said, well, Dustin, she said, I'm sorry, but we were laughing because you have a little patch of gray hair coming in on the side of your head. <laughs> and I said, you know, I really could have done without knowing that because... It's been a struggle. Some of y'all know that it, the struggle is real for me when it comes to getting older. I talk about it all the time. And people complain and say, you talk about being old, but I'm going to my 30-year high school reunion. And I'm like, you know, for me, it is getting old. I feel older. But I've been trying to get better because I know it's kind of annoying when I say I'm old, I'm 25, and you're like not 25 and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but it's been a process. But y'all keep praying for me. I've been getting better about it. I woke up this morning, instead of complaining that it was my birthday, I said, God, I thank you for another year. It's all about your perspective, amen? You got to practice what you preach. But I believe today is going to be a great day. I know that God has some great things in store for us today. I would not rather be anywhere else but here this morning, amen? And I know God is going to do some great things in our lives if we will receive what he has to say and apply it to our lives. I said receive what he has to say and apply it to our lives. And so this morning for this first week, I want us to start in Joshua chapter one and verse one. Joshua chapter one and verse one. And if you brought your Bible, if you would please turn there. If not, they will be putting it on the screen. But here in Joshua chapter one and verse one, the Israelites are having a good day and a bad day. It's a bad day because Moses has died. Their leader, the one who helped deliver them out of Egypt, has died and gone on to heaven. But it's a good day because until Moses died, they were not able to enter into the promised land. And I don't care how much you love somebody, but if your life is made better because they're gone, you're going to be a little bit excited. Amen? So Moses has died. Now they're going to be able to enter the promised land. And that's kind of where we pick up in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1. And it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' minister, Moses, my servant, is dead. So now arise and take his place and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land where I am giving them, the Israelites. And every place upon which a sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given to you, as I promised Moses. And from the wilderness in this Lebanon to the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, Canaan, to the great Mediterranean Sea, on the west shall be your territory. It's just a fancy way of saying you're going to have a whole lot of land. And for some people that have been stuck in the wilderness, they probably would have taken any land. But God said, no, I'm about to give you a great land. I'm about to give you everything that you see everywhere your feet touches will be your land. And he goes on and says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. In other words, God's saying, My promise was not dependent upon a person. My word was not gone when Moses died. It was based on... On my promise what I've said is based on what I promised you what I am going to do is based on what I have promised you my protection my provision is not based on somebody else but it is based on what I've already told you be strong and confident and of good courage for you shall cause this people to inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them only you be strong and very courageous that you may do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall deal wisely and have good success. Verse number 9, have I not commanded you? See, in verse 6, and in seven, he's told them to be strong and courageous. 
But apparently they didn't get it because in verse 9 he says again, Have I not commanded you? Be strong, vigorous, and very courageous. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Have you noticed how God kind of made a habit of repeating himself in the Bible? Like every so often he would say the same thing over and over and over again. Sometimes he'd say it a little bit differently, but a lot of times he'd just say the same thing. Like in verse 6 and in verse 7, he says, be strong and courageous. But in verse 9, he says again, be strong and courageous. Now, I don't think that God repeated himself because he has Alzheimer's. I don't think that God repeated himself because he couldn't remember what he had just said a few verses before. The reason God had to repeat himself so often is because any time God gives a promise or a directive or an action step for us to take, there's going to be some doubt. He knows that we are going to have some doubt seep into our hearts, reasons, questions, concerns of why we cannot do what God has just told us to do. And so he says, you know what, in case you didn't get it the first time, I want you to do this. And then we have our reasons inside of us of why we can't do it. And God's like, no, I want you to do that very thing. Well, God, maybe we should use somebody else. Maybe since Moses is gone, we we should try to do it a little differently. And God says, no, you be strong. You be courageous. And a lot of times we have legitimate reasons why we can't do what God told us to do. We have legitimate questions. We have legitimate concerns. Because for Joshua and the Israelites... Their leader is gone. Moses is dead. The one who has done everything for them is no longer there. So they have their reasons to believe that God cannot do what it is he's telling them to do. But yet at the end of the day, those reasons are simply excuses. Excuses that the enemy brings to us of why we cannot do what God is telling us to do. Reasons of why we're not good enough. Reasons about our past. And the enemy is the master at bringing in self-doubt, self-pity, insecurity, and telling us that we're not good enough and we can no longer do what God's wanting us to do. And so we create an excuse, and we use our own inadequacies as the reason we can't do what God's told us. And so this morning, for the next few moments we spend together, I want to talk to you on the subtitle, No More Excuses. No More Excuses. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for bringing us into your house. I thank you that we are able to come and to serve you and to lift up your name. And God, I pray that you would put me on like a coat and wear me this morning. Use me to do what I cannot do on my own. And I pray that each and every person in here would receive today what you have to say to them. I pray that you would speak directly to their hearts and directly to their souls and their minds. May nobody leave here the same way that they came in, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Now, is anybody in here afraid of bees, wasps, yellow jackets? I mean, afraid, like you scream when you see them. Anybody? If you're sitting next to somebody that doesn't have their hand raised, I don't know what's wrong with you. Because just the buzz alone makes me freak out. Whenever I hear the buzz of a bee or anything at all, I take off running. Now, as I've gotten a little older, I've tried to get a little better and be able to handle it. Because as a husband, you know, you got to show up and show out. And when the wasp comes, you can't be running from it. You can't be scared. Earlier this week, (coughs) sorry, I've been battling this cold all week. Earlier this week. Uh, we had four wasps in our house. And I swear to you that somebody was playing a j- sick joke on us because they know I'm scared of these things. And they're like sticking them in the house to see what I'll do. And, you know, because they know that I have to do this for Kristen, for my wife, to protect her because she's afraid of them as well. But back when I was younger, about 16 years old, I went to a camp. And the only reason I went is because there was a girl there that I liked. Because I do not like camping. I don't camp. I don't know why some of y'all do. I don't know how some of y'all do. Some of y'all are like, well, if you camped with me, it'd be different. No, I do not like camping. I just don't do it. 
And so I decided to go camping, though, because I'm going to suffer for the rights to hopefully get this girl. I'm going to sleep in a tent. I'm going to sleep on rock. I don't understand it. I really don't understand the concept of camping. But I decided that I would go just to be able to be with her and hang out with her and all this kind of stuff. And so it came the time that all the little kids, her little sisters, they all wanted to go through this trail. And so I was like, oh my God, this is my moment. This is my shining moment. This is the moment that God has given me to where I'm going to be able to show this girl that I can be a protector. I can keep people safe. And I'm going to take care of her little sisters. And so she stayed down in the camp. Of course she did. And I decided I was going to go along with the sisters and watch after them. So I had both sisters, and we're going up this trail. And she had told me, please watch my sisters. Please take care of my sisters. Please make sure they're okay. They go up this trail. About four minutes into it, they take off running away from me. And I'm like, I do not like y'all sister that much. I'm not about to run up this trail. So then a few minutes later, one of the sisters comes running at me. And she's screaming at me. And I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she goes, you got to go. You got to go. She's in trouble. And so I'm freaking out. So I take off running and I find the sister, the other one. They're about six, seven, eight years old. And she's going like this. <clears throat> and she's freaking out. And I didn't know she was having a seizure. I didn't know what was happening. So I ran up and I put my hand on her to help her. And I got stung by a yellow jacket because she had stepped into a yellow jacket nest. And when it stung me, I was like, ah! You know, I freaked out. And I took off running down the hill. And the other sister, now I did have a flash in my mind. I was like, what I should do if I want to really win this girl over? I should pick her up. And I should carry her back to the camp. And I'll have all these bees around me. And I'll be struggling. But I'll bring her in and I'll just fall at the feet of this girl. And I'll be like, I saved your sister. And she's going to be like my hero, right? But that's not what I did. I screamed. I took off running away. And then the other sister's still standing in the trail. And it's about this wide. And I'm yelling for her to get out of my way. Move. Get out of my way. Go. I'm coming. And so I'm going to get there. I'm gonna... And she won't move. She's just looking at me like, what are you saying? What are you saying? So when I got to her, I literally heisman her to the ground, hurtled over her, and ran down to the camp. Okay? Y'all think I'm making this up? I'm not. So when I got there, the girl's there that I like. And she's like, you know, where's my sisters? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. They disappeared. And she said, well, I heard a lot of screaming. Are they okay? And I was like, I didn't have the heart to tell her it was me screaming, not the girls. <clears throat> so I was like, yeah, they're fine. They're fine. About a couple seconds later, they come running down the hill. Screaming. Covered in bee stings. Girl had about 20. They had to take her to the hospital. I'm only laughing because she lived. And <clears throat> so they had to take her to the hospital. And the, and the girl that I liked, she's like, what is wrong with you? What were you doing? What were you thinking? And I was like, I'm scared of bees. I don't like bees. And she said, that's no excuse. I told you to watch over them. If you can't watch over them, how do I know you're going to be able to watch over me? And I said, you know what, your sister... You are not worth what I was going to have to go through with your sisters. But anyway, she said, there's no excuse. That is no excuse just because you're afraid of bees, just because you're, that's no excuse. But I allowed my fears of the bees to come in and to stop me from doing the thing I was supposed to be doing. And then I gave an excuse for it. And we do this to God all the time. God will tell us what to do. He will give us a directive. He will give us a command. He will give us an instruction. And then we give him an excuse of why we cannot do what God has told us to do. Well, God, my past is too bad. I'm too messed up. I have too many problems. I don't come from the right side of the tracks. I don't have the right family. I don't have the right upbringing. I don't have the right job. And we give these excuses. But an excuse is simply a reason that's wrapped up into a lie. And so this morning, I want to give you three responses to the enemy. 
whenever he brings you these excuses and tries to get you to think that you cannot do what God's wanting you to do for the best in your life. And the first one on your notes this morning is to not blame the ites. Don't blame the ites. Thanks, baby. That'll borderline make up for you talking about my gray hair yesterday. <clears throat> Don't blame the ites. See, when the Israelites are here in Joshua chapter 1, they've been in the wilderness for about 40 years. But they're about to enter the promised land for the first time. But for 40 years, they walked through the wilderness. 40 years. Now, if you were to talk to them, they would tell you it was because of their enemies. But the truth is, this journey should have taken 11 days. According to the Bible, this was an 11-day journey from start to finish. It should have only taken 11 days. But it took them 40 years. And they would tell you it was because of their enemies. You know, the, the Ishmaelites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, all the ites that they had to face. We have our own ites, by the way. We have the bad spouse ites, the bad parent ites, the bad children ites, the backache ites, the bad boss ites, the poverty ites, the abuse ites. We have all our own ites of why we're not doing what God's wanting us to do and why it's taking so long for us to get there. But it was not their enemies. It wasn't the enemies that stopped them. See, we forget that we have authority over the devil. We forget that we can control the devil. Now, that doesn't mean he's not going to try to attack you. It doesn't mean he's not going to try to stop you. But if you know who you are and whose you are, he cannot win. He cannot beat you. We have authority over him. And so everybody wants to blame the devil. Everybody wants to say how the devil's stopping them. And the devil's the reason they can't do what God's wanting them to do. But we have authority over the devil. And, and we give him too much credit all the time. It was not their enemies. It was their attitude. See, their attitude of complaining and, and griping and groaning about everything that wasn't going the way that they wanted it to go. And so then they felt as if they couldn't do what God had told them to do. Earlier this week, I was complaining about my to-do list. And I was like, God, there's no way I can do everything on this to-do list. Because you realize that complaining alone is a sin. The Bible says to be grateful. It says to be thankful. Complaining alone is a sin. But I was like, God, nobody can be expected to do everything on this to-do list. It's just the enemy trying to distract me. It's just the devil trying to get me to realize that, that I can't get all this stuff done and then I'm not getting anything done because I'm so focused on everything and I'm too spread out and I have too many problems going on. And God was like, you made the to-do list. If you don't like it, change it. The devil did not write your to-do list for you. You wrote it for yourself. Then I was walking to check the mail and I passed the grass in our front yard and I realized that some of it was dead. There were some great ground, uh, brown spots coming up. And I got all upset because I'm like, God, things are already a little tight. Now we have to run the water bill up by running the sprinkler because you're not sending any rain. And God was like, last week you complained about the fact that it rained every day. Now you're going to complain about the fact that there is no rain. Come on, you can't have it both ways. It's all in our attitude. Are you going to allow your circumstances and the people around you to stop you? Or are you going to make up your mind, I'm still going to do what God told me to do, even though it may not seem like I can do it? It wasn't their enemies. It was their attitude. Look back with me at Joshua chapter 1. And in verse 1 it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' minister, Moses, my servant, is dead. He's dead. Now they knew that. And God wasn't saying he didn't care. And he wasn't saying that they shouldn't care. When somebody leaves our lives, it's, it's sad and it's hard. He was just saying it's time to move on. See, they had been mourning for 30 days. And he said it's time to move on. Up till this point, Moses had done everything for them. He prayed for them. He, he sacrificed for them. He, repeated, he repented for them. He literally did everything. They didn't have to do anything. 
Moses handled everything. And so God tells Joshua, before he says it's time to enter into the promised land, he said, you have to move on from Moses. Why? Because he knew that as soon as he told them what he was requiring of them, the very first thing they would do is give him an excuse of why they needed to stay in the wilderness. Well, with Moses gone, God, we can't do anything. We don't know how to handle this stuff. Moses did everything. We can't do it. We have to stay here. Because if they thought they had problems and enemies on the outside of the promised land, they had no idea what they were about to experience when they got inside the promised land. Because the word possess in the Bible means that you first must dispossess the current occupants. They were fixing to have some battles. They were fixing to have some things that they had never had to do on their own. That they had never had to handle without Moses. And God knew that they would start to cry out, how come we don't have Moses? How are we expected to do this without Moses? How are we expected to do this with the one who brought us this far? And God wanted them to know it wasn't Moses. It was me. And I'm still with you. And Moses' death is not an excuse. That thing that left your life is not an excuse for why you can't go on. That situation that left your life is not an excuse for why you can't do what God told you to do and to move forward. That area in your life that you depended on so closely is not an excuse for why you have to stay in the wilderness. God said, I'm going to be with you, but you have to move on for Moses. See, God's given us all this land. He's given us all these blessings. He's given us all these provisions freely bought by the blood of Christ. And all he tells us to do is to possess it. Get up and possess it. What do we think that means? I guess just kind of sit on the couch, pray a little bit, watch some TV, you know, kick our feet up, and just wait for a download. There it is. God, I need... $300. Can you just like put it right here right now, please? God's like, why don't you work overtime for a week? I don't know. Maybe you get an extra couple hundred bucks. See, we always pray and we're asking God, God, I need this. God, I need that. God, and God's telling us to do something so that we can get what it is we need. And we don't listen because it requires some action. And we want God to just, whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. I know y'all thought it. So we're, we're all upset, and, and we start blaming the devil. Well, you know, man, devil's trying to break up my marriage. Devil's trying to ruin my family. No, maybe you just shouldn't have been going over somewhere else instead of staying with your spouse. Maybe you should have resisted that person that was at work instead of staying with your spouse. Well, the enemy's trying to take away my tithe money by causing me to have to repair my car this week. You know, my car broke down, the engine blew up on me, now i got to fix it. It's the devil's fault. He's stopping me. Maybe you should have changed your oil 10,000 miles ago when the light came on. You know, we want to blame the devil for everything. And so we rebuke the devil, and we rebuke the devil, and we rebuke him, and we rebuke him. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you have rebuked the devil at least 100,000 times. We rebuke the devil for everything. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we will rebuke until our rebuker is broken. And then we still have problems. And we wonder why we still have problems. But see, it's not enough to just rebuke the devil. It's not enough to just shout at the devil and to yell at the devil. We have to make some life changes too. It requires some action on our parts. We have to start obeying what God says to do. We like to quote, resist the devil and he will flee, right? We always say that. Resist the devil and he will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee. I've been resisting the devil, but I'm still facing the same situation. I've been resisting the devil, but I'm still nowhere further than I was. I've been resisting the devil, but he ain't fleed yet. Because we don't like to quote the first part of that scripture. That says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. See, it starts with the submission. It starts to saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I don't care if I don't like it. I don't care if it's hard. I will do whatever it is you tell me to do and resist the devil. And then the devil will flee because then 
you're in God's order. Then you're in line with what God's wanting to do. You're obeying God, resisting the devil, and God will take care of the rest. He'll handle everything else. It starts with the little things. Everybody gets so focused. I want the big promotion. I want the big raise. I want the nice car. I want the perfect family. I want the perfect spouse. I want all these things. But it starts with the little things. Submitting to and obeying God, it starts with the small stuff. God said, if you will obey me in the little things, I will make you a ruler over much. I'll break it down real, real, real simple for you. Anybody in here, being honest, we're all family, ever taken some office supplies or school supplies and put them in your purse or in your pocket and taken them home? Pencils, paper clips, pens, paper, stamps. Used to. Listen, if you have been taking home office supplies and you hadn't been taking home stamps, you're doing it wrong. Because stamps are some of the most expensive office supplies out there. Like 44 cents a pop. But you take these office supplies, you know, and it's like nobody knows, nobody's going to be okay. Look at your neighbor, tell him, he ain't talking about me. <clears throat> Look at your other neighbor, tell him, oh no, he's talking about you. <coughs> but see, we do that and we know that it's not really the right way to be. We know that it's not, there's my voice, we know that it's not really how we're supposed to be. We know it's not exactly the best thing for us to be doing in that moment. But you know what we do? We make an excuse for it. Well, bless God, they don't pay me enough anyways. You see the kind of stuff they're going and doing? They have plenty of money. They can buy some more office supplies. I'm over here barely scraping by. I can use some stamps to pay my bills. Or we'll say things like, well, you know, my boss is really not a good person. They don't attend church. They're not a Christian. My teacher, they're not a Christian. They don't serve the Lord. And the Bible says that... The unrighteous lay up things. He's taking the things from the unrighteous, giving them to the righteous and to the just, and I'm just taking what's mine. You know, I'm going to play the part of God. and do that. I, know, I feel him speaking to me right now. He said, while they are out of the room, I need to go and grab this thing, and I need to take it home. We justify it. We make excuses for why we're doing what we know that we shouldn't be doing in that current situation. But you know what? It does not matter what they do. I said, it does not matter what they do. Well, they popped off at me first, so now I'm going to pop off at them and make, every, make sure everybody in here knows I'm not acting Christ-like, but then I'm going to cover it up with, thank you, Jesus, when I walk away. It doesn't matter what they do. What matters is what you do and the way that you respond to what they do. See, you have to start obeying and submitting to God, in spite of your inadequacies, in spite of your insecurities, in spite of your past, in spite of what people have said to you, in spite of what people have done to you, you have to obey God, submit it to Him, and He'll take care of the rest. See, prayer is great. I love prayer. Prayer is awesome. And we need to pray. But we can't pray and ask God to do something. And then start giving him reasons and excuses of why we cannot do what he's told us to do so that he can bring that thing to pass that we've been praying and asking him for. It requires action. You have to pray as if it's up to God, but you have to act and work as if it's up to you. You have to do your part. You can't just sit there and, and let things go by. See, God, we'll pray to God, God, I need this, and I need that, and, and I need this situation. And God says, okay, here's what you need to do. You need to go, and you need to do this. And we're like, oh, but God, can't you just, like, do it? Like, can't you just do it, God? And then it doesn't happen, and we start blaming the devil, or we start blaming our family, or we, stop we start blaming the fact that we weren't brought up right and that we didn't know better. But we have to do what God tells us to do. We pray as if it's up to him. But we work as if it's up to us. Next thing on your notes. It's true for them. True for you. True for them, true for you. A lot of times, our excuses don't flow out of thinking that God can't do it. They flow out of thinking that God can't do it for you. See, you know that God can do it. You've seen him do it for some other people. But for whatever reason, it's just never been made real to you. And who you are and how those two connect, it's just never 
never been made real. And so God told Joshua in verse 5, he said, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will not fail you nor forsake you. God's saying, I was with Moses, but I'm going to be with you too. What I did for Moses, I'm going to do for you too. And you know what this does? It helps get rid of jealousy. Because we look at people and we say, now why in the world would God bless them? Why in the world would God be helping them? You know the good things that they could have done with the money they used to buy that house? You know what they could have done with the money they used to buy that car? Or why is God using that person over there? They've only been saved for six months. I've been saved for 20 years. And he doesn't use me like that. But what we fail to realize is that we have the capabilities in God that they do. It's just that they've been following the instructions and the actions that God has told them to take. You don't know that that person that's only been serving God for six months has been laying on their face before God, crying out to him, asking for a fresh pouring, asking to see his presence, asking to see the manifestation of him on this earth while you sit at TV and flip between Netflix. Yeah, y'all don't want to, okay. We want what everybody else has, but we don't want to make the sacrifices that everybody else has made. And so then we just make the excuse, well, God just can't do it for me. But he is no respecter of persons. What God did for one person, he can do for somebody else. But you don't know what they did to get where they are. So if it's true for them, it is, it's true for you. And we'll be like, well, I know God wants other people to be happy. I know he wants other people to be blessed. I know he wants other people to see the fulfillment, the fulfillment of his blessing in their life. But I just don't think he can do it for me. And God's like, I'm right here with you, Joshua. Everything I did for Moses, I will do for you. I've already given you the victory, just like I gave them the victory. But you have got to get up and possess what's already yours. You have to get what I've already prepared for you. See, if the enemy cannot stop you from winning, he will stop you from realizing that you walk in total victory. Stop believing the lies and, and the excuses and the concerns of the enemy in your life of why you cannot do what God wants you to do. Just because you're 75 years old, it doesn't mean that God can't still use you. Just because you're a single mom, it doesn't mean that God can't bless you. Just because you were raised without a father, it does not mean that you have to fall in line with the other statistics. Every person in this room is destined for greatness. Every person in this room has greatness in their life because you were created by a great creator. And so everybody can do great things regardless of your upbringing, regardless of your past, regardless of your mistakes, regardless of your job, regardless of your social status, regardless of your family. You can do great things, but you have to make a decision to get up and do what God has told you to do. See, you can be pitiful or you can be powerful, but you cannot be both. You can't walk around, oh me, nothing good ever happens for me. I always get the bad end of things. God's blessing everybody else. God's helping everybody else. I'm just barely getting by. I'm just barely making it. I'll never catch a break. This is my life. You can't walk around like that and expect to walk in the power of God. You can't walk around complaining and giving excuses for what you don't have and expect to be blessed with what God's doing in other people's life. You can be pitiful or powerful, but you cannot be both. And it's a choice that only you can make. Last point on your notes, motivate yourself. <clears throat> motivate yourself. God told Joshua in verse 8, he said, and I'll just go to part B. He said, for then you shall make your way prosperous, and you shall deal wisely and have good success. He didn't say, I'm going to do it. He didn't say, I'm going to handle all this stuff. He said, Joshua, you're going to do it. He's telling Joshua two things. First, he's telling him, 
you're going to have to take some action. It's going to require some things of you. It's not up to just the other people around you or to me. You're going to have to do some things. But the second thing he's telling Joshua is I've already prepared the way. You will come in and take over, but I've already equipped you. God has already equipped you with everything you need to do what he's telling you to do in life. And yet we walk around without the realization and we think that God has to come and do everything for us right in front of our face when the truth is a lot of times he's enabled us to do the very things we're asking him to do. So he said, you shall make your way prosperous and you shall deal wisely and have good success. I don't believe that you can motivate anybody. I don't believe that anybody can motivate somebody else. You can inspire them, but you cannot motivate them. And every week it is our prayer when you come to EP that you leave inspired to see God work in your life. But we can't make you do what you need to do to see God work. We can't motivate you. Oprah cannot motivate you. Tony Robbins cannot motivate you. Nobody can motivate you and make you do anything. You have to do it yourself. You get inspired and you say, you know what? God, I'm going to go out and I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to do what you created me to do. I'm going to be who you've created me to be. Because I know that you've enabled me in my life to see these things come to pass. He told Joshua, he said, you've been enabled, you've been given the capability, but you are going to have to get up and inherit and possess the land. Have you ever noticed how God and Jesus made a habit of telling crippled people to walk and dead people to get up? The man with the withered arm, his arm was stuck like this. He couldn't move it. It was withered. And God told him, stretch your arm forth. He was always telling people to do things that they could not do. And they had legitimate reasons why they couldn't do what God was telling them to do. It's like, Jesus, that's why I came to you. That's why I brought my situation to you, because I can't do it. I can't walk. I wish I could. Dude's dead. He's not going to be able to just stand up. My arm is stuck. It's withered. I can't do anything. And God says, stretch out. And I don't know if it was just their initial, you know, just, just. But as soon as they moved, God's power came in. And they saw him manifest the very thing they needed. Jesus was always telling people to do things that they could not do. I'll close with the guy in John chapter 5. Popular story, a guy, crippled guy, laying by the pool. Been crippled for 38 years. 38 years he's been crippled laying by this pool. And Jesus shows up. And he asked the guy... How long have you been here? Now, it wasn't that Jesus didn't know. Jesus knows. He's Jesus. But it was that he kind of wanted the guy to be shocked and be like, you know, one, two, three, four. God, 38 years I've been here. That's longer than some of us in here have been alive. For 38 years, he's been laying there. Might I ask you, what mountain have you been going around? What's the situation in your life that you just cannot seem to get past? What's that area that you just can't seem to get around, to get over? What's your excuse? What's your reason for why you're still where you are? Told him 38 years. 38 years I've been here. Been laying here. And y'all know the story. I'd encourage you to read it if you get time in the Amplified Bible this week. But you know the story, he's been laying by this pool for 38 years and the angel comes once a year, stirs up the water. And when he does, one person gets a miracle, the first one that gets in to the water. And 38 years, this guy's been laying here hoping to draw the lottery. Now watch this though. He says to Jesus, he says, every time I try to get into the pool, somebody else gets in ahead of me. And sir, I have nobody to put me in the pool. 
What's he saying? I feel so sorry for myself. For 38 years, Jesus, I've been laying here. I didn't ask to be crippled. I didn't want to be like this. I want to be healed. But sir, I have nobody here. I'm all alone. I'm all by myself. I have nobody to help put me in the pool. I'm all alone. Now you're like, well, duh, Dustin. Guy was crippled. Couldn't move. Couldn't get in the pool. But here's how I am about it. In 38 years, I could do something. I mean, come on, pardon me for a moment. But in 38 years, if I'm laying here, well, you know, I don't know how to be laying. I'd want to be comfortable. But if I'm laying here for 38 years, I can at least, you know, eh, you know, something. And I tell you, if I get passed up this year, next year by the time that angel comes, I'm going to be right up on the edge of this baby. Come on, somebody. I know you may be at a disadvantage. I know you may not have everything you think you need. I know you may not understand everything that's going on around you, but no more excuses. God, I know that you have created me. I know that you have gifted me. I know that you have enabled me to do the very things that you are telling me to do. And God, I won't give excuses. I won't blame it on everybody else. I won't blame it on the enemy, but I will take responsibility and I will do everything that I've created to do because I know it's not about me but it's about the God that lives on the inside of me and I will get ready to possess everything that you have set up for me to possess no more excuses I know life hasn't always been good I know you might not have had the best upbringing I know you might be in a difficult situation right now but if you will make your mind up to pray and to obey and to do what God has called you to do, no matter how hard it is, no matter how impossible it may seem, God, I'm going to do whatever it is you tell me to do so that I can see the very thing that you promised me. Would you stand to your feet, please?